All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. Welcome back again to another episode of PyTorch Community Voices. Uh, I'm your host for today. I'm Jessica, Jessica Lin, a developer advocate at Facebook uh, focused on our AI and ML open source projects. Uh, so uh, for those of you joining for the first time, uh, PyTorch Community Voices is a, a weekly live stream where we get to interview folks from around the PyTorch community who are building and using PyTorch in really cool ways. Uh, so today, um, I'm really excited to welcome our two guests on. So it'll be Natasha and Patricio. Uh, so they're from MindsDB. Um, so for some background, uh, MindsDB, I think maybe some of you have heard of them before. And so, so from, their, from their website, like I guess the, their tagline is to be able to do machine learning in your database using SQL. Um, and like, what does this mean? I think from the prep talk with them, it uh, it kind of unearthed a lot of really interesting ideas about um, how we can take this concept of machine learning and kind of potentially like almost push it upstream and be able to enable folks who uh, don't have a strong, um, that kind of expert ML background and be able to give them the tools to be able to do that uh, straight from that database. So I think they, they're gonna come on, so they're gonna come on and be able to explain this um, in much more depth uh, then I've I've uh, positioned it for you guys, but I think it'd be a really interesting conversation to kind of you know, think about different ways of doing ML and different places of doing it. Uh, so I'm going to bring Natasha and Patricio on today. Hey guys, hello, hello, hey, welcome. So how about uh, to kick it off? Um, let's do a quick intro. Um, how about maybe we'll start with Natasha? She's great. Uh, Hello from very rainy Philadelphia. I'm cool. Natasha, and I'm on the research team at MindsDB. Nice. Welcome. And then Patricia. Yeah, um, happy to be here all the way from Chile, South America, uh, part of the research team as well. Um, and yeah, <laughs> very short introduction. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, yeah, we'll let the, we'll let the project do the talking then. Um, so then for those of you who uh, are watching in the audience, uh, the way that the show is run is that um, in the next 15, 20 minutes, Natasha and Patricia will have a stage. So they'll do a, they'll do a presentation uh, to give you a, a deep dive um, into, into this project. And then throughout this time, we definitely want folks in the audience to ask questions. So this is your time to ask these experts um, questions on the projects. Um, maybe if you're interested in how, in how to use it, uh, questions about that. Uh, maybe if you are using it already, you know, put those comments below. We'd love to hear hear about that. Um, so yeah, ask those questions while they're doing their presentation, and then after that, we'll have a live QA session. So we'll actively ask your questions to our to our guests. So with that, um, are you two ready to kick off the presentation? We're ready. All right. So I'll pull this up on screen, and I'll take myself back. Um, wait, should I take? Both of you, or should I, should I um, yes. are both of you on? Okay, sounds good. Bye. See ya. Wonderful. Well, it's wonderful to be here. And today we're going to talk a little bit about our work of PyTorch through SQL commands, but more generally deploying machine learning models in the database. Now to start this talk off, we know that data is central to machine learning problems. And in fact, we have no shortage of it in the everyday life. Now, databases have grown tremendously since the 60s to be able to cope with this massive surge of information from the file based iterations from long ago to the cloud offerings that we have today. Now, on the other hand, machine learning has also had a rich history. We have a lot of algorithms being developed, but more interestingly, in the last five years or so, massive strides toward accessibility have happened. In particular, PyTorch and TensorFlow, two of the biggest ML libraries, enable users to have custom models. However, there's a bit of a gap. We have these gigantic stores of data and we have these new model building tools that make it so that you can deploy custom models. So bringing the data to the model, training it, and then returning it back in a way that a database can create an application for whatever downstream task you have is non-trivial. And this is typically called ML ops. And unsurprisingly, this is a very hard problem. And in fact, a recent study has shown that nearly 64% of companies spend a month to over a year to get an ML model into production. Many of the reasons why are because these data pipelines can be very complex with custom data and custom treatment requires very strong, robust pipelines to be able to build. And so automation is one possible solution for this. 
And in particular, a recent study looking at the life cycle of the data science ML pipeline has identified three main components that are most useful for automation. In particular, this is data pre-processing, feature engineering, and model building and training. And we see that non-technical users all the way to expert researchers all ask for some level of automation to help enhance their process and bring production faster for ML models. So with that in mind, there are three particular questions MindsDB thinks about when we work on our models. First, how do we make predictions accessible to the database? Oftentimes, databases have slick APIs and ways to be able to deploy into your applications quickly, but these complex ML ops are non-trivial. The next, we want to make sure this process is reproducible and robust. Those three automatable steps, the data pre-processing, feature engineering, and model building, need to be in such a modular way that you can customize and plug and play as needed in a way that you expect. And lastly, we believe that this should be easily customizable. It shouldn't be that you have to dig through vast amounts of source code to be able to deploy your custom routines. And so in the spirit of that, we're going to be talking about three particular things that we're doing here at MindsDB as a whole. First is MindsDB as a global idea, the abstraction of treating predictors as AI tables. So therefore, you'll treat your models as if they were tables in your database, allowing you to query them and deal with them in the way you would a table. The next will turn to how we build our machine learning frameworks, and this is where the PyTorch comes in, specifically around Lightwood, our flexible AutoML framework that talks about the modularity around data preparation, feature engineering, and model building. And lastly, I'm going to talk about some of the work we use for building customizable approaches, specifically JSON, which is a declarative ML language we've been building on to allow users to be able to import models without needing to change source code. We believe that users are the experts of their data and therefore should be able to deploy their custom routines. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Patricio, who will be talking about bringing models to the database through AI tables. Thank you, Natasha. Um, indeed. So MindsDB proper um, is the glue, I would say, between the models in Lightwood and the database that you're using. So we aim at changing the paradigm from the classic applied machine learning pipeline that you've got on the left hand side here, where you've got the database, you have your application, and then there's loads of ETL transformations that go from and to the database to feed your machine learning model. And then once you've got the output, you have, again, to maintain more than one uh, connection. So we want to migrate to this schema on the right hand side, where you only have a single bridge between your data in the database, but also the data that your predictive model outputs. So you're basically not distinguishing between them. Um, and MySDB makes sure that this is possible through a series of connectors for all the databases that we support, as well as um, business intelligence tools like Superset or um, uh, systems like Redis or Kafka for stream processing. And we're basically trying to be SQL compliant, which means that any kind of SQL query with special syntax designed for MindsDB gets parsed, interpreted, then planned. So we, we have to see for any given query, what is the model that gets used in that query? And this controller basically uh, gives the final call to Lightwood, which is where the machine learning models with PyTorch, amongst others, reside. Um, so here are some examples. If you wanted to create a model, you use the create predictor syntax. And when you train it, you give an arbitrary SQL um, statement from your database. The idea is to predict a particular column in your data set. And this command triggers behind the scenes an auto ML process that Natasha will uh, further explain. And once your predictor is trained, you can make a single prediction by basically selecting the predicted column from your predictor conditioning it on some uh, data that you want to use. So in this case, we're predicting the used, uh, like the price of a used car that is uh, an Audi A6 with 12,000 miles and was made on 2016. But you normally would like to do like a batch prediction. And in that case, you simply join the predictor with the data that, we, that will be passed as input. And that is the syntax in the third example. We have additional interfaces for MindsDB, so you can also interact uh, with it through our SDKs for Python and JavaScript. 
And then also there is a graphical user interface called MindsDB Studio, where we try to make this as easy and intuitive as possible. So with that, I want to talk a little bit about the ML core, specifically Lightwood. This is where all the PyTorch models and the flexible framework exists for building your models. Now, the way we think about Lightwood is in the intuitive process of the ML pipeline. There's a data pre-processing step, a feature engineering step, and the model building and the training. I'll go through each of these examples at a high level, but fundamentally, the pre-processing recognizes each type of a column, the feature engineering constructs a feature vector for each individual column, depending so from the raw text to the output of interest. And the model concatenates these different feature vectors from each of the columns into one for each row that gets trained into a predictor that gives you the target of interest. So how does this work under the hood? Well, let's first start with the pre-processing. The user will specify a problem definition. So they'll have to say, for example, in your table that you have, what's the target? So what's the column that's going to be the actual predicted output? Once that happens, Lightwood will take small samples of each of the columns to try to infer the data type. This can then help us with the feature engineering. For example, the way we treat numerical versus categorical data in its feature representations are going to be different. Once that occurs, we'll deal with some of the pesky data cleaning processes, so dealing with those NANDs and other things that can be very difficult to handle in a model. And then finally, we'll do a statistical analysis. The statistical analysis doesn't touch the underlying data, but it explicitly says things like what's the distribution of each column. We believe for responsible machine learning, knowing what is going on with each of the features before you train them can help indicate, for example, what features are very noisy or what classes might be imbalanced a priori to building a model. Next is the actual encoder. And now the encoder represents the feature engineering. For each column, we wanna be able to represent raw text into a input that a model can actually take. And so the recipe for all of our encoders deals from an abstraction called the base encoder that has five key ingredients. First is an initialization where any keyword arguments of your encoder of interest are passed. Then there's a prepare statement. The prepare statement asks if it's rule-based, you can pass it, but if it's a learned model, you can train an actual model, for example, in PyTorch, to be able to create an embedded representation. For example, text deals with this. Next is the actual encode step. This takes the raw data input for the column of interest and converts it to the feature vector. Likewise is a decode step where, in certain cases, you can take the raw embedding and convert it to the original data of interest. And lastly is a two command to allow you to deploy on either CPU or GPU. Similarly, there's a model abstraction for the actual predictors themselves. There are only four key ingredients here. First, the initialization, any keywords that you want your model algorithm of choice, and then the fit command. Now, again, the goal of the model is to be able to take these feature vectors and be able to predict an output target of interest. So the feature vectors from each of the columns are concatenated to one big feature vector that's fed into the base model. The fit command allows you to take all of those feature vectors and then train a predictor, whether it's classification or regression, to yield the output of interest. You can use this model with the call command to be able to make predictions on new data. And lastly, we've implemented a partial fit function, which says that if you have a model that's already been trained and you have new data, you can further tune this with the new information at hand from the prior checkpoints. So that being said, we want to think about how can we introduce customization and control in this process. And to do this, I'm going to go through a very high level of a potential example problem. We highly encourage you to go through our workbook that we made here at the following link on our GitHub, but it will go through an example of what's called a mass language model classifier. Now note, this is not the standard way to do classification for language models in particular, but just to show how creative you can be with these different types of encoders and models. So in the starting premise of the problem, we start with a data set and it has two columns. One of them are hotel reviews in text and the other is a rating, which is a review from one to five. What we wanna do is create a priming sequence with a hidden mask token. And the goal is for a model to be able to say from the vocabulary, can we predict what the rating should be? So this means we'll add five new tokens, one for each rating for the vocabulary, and we will want to explicitly predict which of those five tokens might yield the rating of interest. So to omit some of the details, again, please visit this code base, but we can see how this pipes into our pipeline. 
First, with the text in the data pre-processing, we'll leave it as is because we don't want to do any uh, stop word removal or anything. So we'll have the type inferencing where rating is going to be detected as categorical and review, which is the text information, will be detected, dictated as text. Next, we're going to override the text encoder that we have, pre-trained lang, with a custom MLM encoder. And as you can see, it's as simple as plopping it into the encoder folder of our Lightwood repo. Next, we're going to create a custom output model. Since our encoder is only a single column and it's a pre-trained language model, we can inherit from that model and create a unit classifier that predicts the classes based on the encoder alone. And so with that, I'll pass it over to Patricia, who can explain, instead of changing anything in the source code, how you can import your custom module to be able to build things using JSON. Exactly. This is actually a new feature we have since our last talk in the PyTorch ecosystem day. So the premise behind JSON or JSON AI is to um, implement a system that lets you do ML in a declarative way. Um, as you were seeing in the example that Natasha showed, uh, the normal way that you use an encoder can be arbitrarily customized. And the way we do this is we expose all the necessary configuration parameters of a model in a JSON-like file. And this gets exposed in our uh, graphical user interface, but you can also edit it manually. Um, and the idea behind this is even if you're an expert or if you're uh, a novice in machine learning, you might want to leverage already made uh, machine learning blocks and insert them and just you know um, connect them in, into the greater context of your entire model. So in this case, if you'll notice uh, the line that's highlighted, we have a module that is the one that corresponds to the review column, the one with the text, the freeform text. And the default is to use uh, what we call the pre-trained language encoder, but you can easily um, toggle or change this module to be the, the newly added MLM encoder. Um, if you can show it, Natasha, exactly. Uh, so you can edit this and then like pass this JSON configuration file to MindsDB, which will then interpret the file, generate the Python code for this predictor. So it, you know, from the reproduci reproducibility perspective, it will also be saved. And then you can just use this new module. And this goes further than just you know the encoders. You can also specify models. You can specify procedures for your data cleaning, for your statistical analysis, even for explainers. Once the model's trained, then you want to calculate confidence estimations or uh, explainability insights. So it's it's a powerful paradigm. So with that, let's summarize. Today, we talked to you about what MindsDB does, which is it allows you to treat your predictor models as if they were tables in your database. Next, we discussed a little bit about Lightwood, which allows you to deploy either default routines or your custom own models for the data pre-processing, the feature engineering, and the model building steps. And lastly, we gave you a bit of a sneak peek of JSON, which is our declarative language to allow you to quickly edit and modify different elements of the framework without having to make hard edits to massive code bases. So again, we strongly encourage you to try this and see what you think of it. Uh, we'll have, at the end of the month, in time for Hacktoberfest, a couple of interesting opportunities to be able to contribute to our encoders and our mixers and our pipeline. So we'd love to take any questions, and we hope you would join our mission. Nice. Thank you, guys. That was a really interesting conversation. And our our um, our guests definitely feel the same. Um, I'm just going to throw up some comments as you were talking. Uh, so Hugo. Um, Hugo from YouTube is saying, you know, he loves Mind, Minds TV. Um, he thinks it's great too. Uh, some other folks are definitely just commenting that, yeah, it's definitely like a very easy um, tool to use. Um, and then, yeah, Bastion says it's a great idea and he can't wait to use it at his own company. Um, and I, I'd also love to hear, you know, Bastion, if, uh, yeah, if you, oh, we definitely, oh, yeah, also even more comments coming in. Yeah, it looks interesting from Solve. Salve Magia, um, and then uh, Tran and Q uh, says, "How can we find MindsDB?" Well, you know, there's some resources that the guests have uh, posted throughout the presentation. Um, so yeah, definitely take a look at their website. Um, I think it's just mindsdb.com. Uh, there's a good good list of resources there and documentation. Um, maybe we can kind of segue into, yeah, if 
if someone is interested in learning more about how to take their current implementation and switch over, what are ways that they can go about that? Can we talk about resources? Yeah. So to find MindsDB, we actually highly encourage you to take a peek at our source code in GitHub. So it's just github.com slash MindsDB. All of our work, of course, is open source, so you can take a look. Very shortly, by the end of the month, we'll have actually uh, up-to-date documentation on all of these beta features we're testing out. So the uh, current tutorial that we posted will walk you through all of the steps required. There's even a custom branch if you want to you know, not worry about any of the imports or anything like that. Um, but that's one possible strategy. Hmm. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so actually kind of segueing into a question that I had, um, can you talk a bit about the current use cases, like what com what companies are using them? Um, you have some interesting stories about maybe how they're transitioned? Sure. Um, so one of the cool uh, pipelines we have, uh, like I said, a supported use case that uh, really gets traction is multivariate time series. Um, it usually is very painful to, to design a pipeline that can handle like several time series in parallel. Um, and so a lot of the pre-processing work there is completely automated in, in MindsDB. And we've seen lots of people try this out um, and use it not only in the context of normal forecasting, but also on like unsupervised anomaly detection, which uh, can be enabled thanks to like our analysis phase post model training. Um, there's also lots of people that have used it uh, on, on more normal contexts. So I, I know, for instance, people in Canada are using it to, you know, determine like um, the performance of students and trying to help them um, as they go about their studies. There's people in like in Spain trying to design like monitoring systems for ad uh, consumption in like in web players. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, Natasha, if you've got some other, other examples, but. Yeah, we were actually working with a company who's working on um, sort of recreating coffee. So with different types of molecular compounds. And so we work with them on predicting from a spectra if they can get certain profiles that they're looking for for their coffee. So definitely ranges the spectrum of use cases. I mean, it's kind of like if you have the use case, uh, you can use the tools to figure out how to uh, leverage it better. Maybe um, to add, um, we do uh, we do supervise learning right now, and mm. for complex data types, we have transformers for text, and we have like a you know custom proprietary way of doing time series as well. So mm. we're looking, thinking about images and whatnot. But right now, if you have an encoder you're interested in and a data set, you're welcome to try it out. I think there was a recent blog post right um, regarding the time series implementation. Uh, so yeah, if folks are listening, definitely check check that out. Probably just do a Google of time series minus DB PyTorch. Should be the first hit that comes up. Um, so I'm going to jump over into some more questions that are coming in. Um, let's see. I think this one might be a little bit more into the details of things. So Duong Win from YouTube says, can we move slash transfer data from Oh, sorry, no, right. I, I misread it. Can we move slash transfer data from another database to MindsDB? Um, maybe you can talk about how how it's set up. Is it actually moving it from another database into MindsDB, or is it like are you leveraging your existing database? So um, the connectors we have um, aim to generate the output of the predictor and then just pass this over to the database. So when you have the output of a predictor, you can save this as uh, a table, right? And the same when it comes to the input. So if you want to move data to, to MindsDB, it's just you don't really need to. You just put the query for training. You specify which data you want to use. And then MindsDB handles it internally. Like It sends the relevant data to the predictor. It trains it. And then once trained and you predict something, um, the bridge is already there. So you don't, you don't need to handle anything. Like You'll see the data in your database. Nice. And then Kostya is asking, can an existing PyTorch model be deployed to a database using MindsDB to be queried via SQL syntax? Um, it would have to conform to the specification that Nadasha showed. Um, it might be tricky. Like We had the functionality to upload models at some point. Right now, I'm not sure it can be supported out of the box, though. Um, 
So there's sort of two approaches. When you say an existing PyTorch model, if you have this script or sort of the algorithmic logic, absolutely, there are certain commands, for example, the ingredients that I talked about for the base encoder in the model, that in fact, you can just add to your uh, approach and that should work out of the box into our approach. Um, whether it's an actual pre-trained model with all the checkpoints, that is a little bit of a different story. We're working on that actually, uh, so we can be able to access, so people have their homegrown models as well. But that's something in the pipeline for sure. Hmm. Another reason to yeah keep tabs on their on their GitHub repo. So maybe start and then just yeah check out their page. I know they mentioned before they're running um, they run they run uh, seminars like every month or so. So I think that's a good way to just keep a pulse on um, what, what the team's up to. So they're definitely doing a lot over there. Um, yeah, so yeah, please keep your questions coming in. Uh, yeah, good questions. So while we're, oh, I think did another question come in? Oh, no. Um, yeah, so while we're waiting for, for those questions to, to chime in, um, I'll just yeah, ask a couple of kind of light bulb questions. So how did the name Lightwood come about? Um, is it re referring to anything specifically? Yeah, I think um, we wanted something flexible and fast and Lightwood just seemed to work out just fine. Um, I see. So. so it has no like pop culture reference. I feel like that's pretty common in naming. No, well, you know, we were actually thinking, we're like, you know, should we rename it? But we got so used to calling it Lightwood that it, it just fits it. Mm, I see. What I do know though is MindsDB has a, like an inspiration on the, on the culture saga by Ian Banks, I think, like a science fiction saga, where mm -hmm. you have this like um, intelligent beings, like AI uh, machines, well, basically spaceships, and they're called the Minds, right? And um, I think the name came from that originally. Oh, I see. <laughs> Interesting. The Minds. Um, so, how about can we talk a little bit about uh, the users who would be using um, using MindsDB? Maybe we can talk about the ideal user or who 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 this who this product is aimed at um, and kind of in that same vein uh, like a question that I asked in a prep call that I found interesting when I first listened to this was it was kind of changing the paradigm of who is able to do machine learning uh, so can you talk a little bit about those points uh, I'm happy to take this one. So yeah, we think right now there's this paradigm. We have you know often domain experts who know their data in and out, but building complex pipelines are non-trivial. On the other hand, you have ML researchers who have like ins and outs of every algorithm, but they might not know exactly what to do with the data because it's so specialized. And so because of that, you know, oftentimes we have products that cater to one or the other, and we would like the average user to be any of the above. It should be that you can deploy these models effectively, but if you know enough to be able to customize it and make very specific changes, then we shouldn't impede you from doing that. So the average user, I think, right now has been someone who wants to use machine learning and not necessarily want to build these really complicated methodologies. But you know, Patricia and I are researchers as well. We are very biased in that we love to think about hard algorithms and how to implement them in a generalizable way. So we've been making strides toward building that bridge between the you know super technical user on the ML side and perhaps the domain expert on the other side. Yeah, and I think you know this is actually based on on, a, on my real experience. Before I joined MindsDB, I found the solution in GitHub, just looking for stuff. Uh, I had a project at the time where I was like working as a data scientist, and I wanted like a quick baseline based on on some neural network. Um, and it was a, a pretty standard problem of you know classification. So I snooped around a bit, and I found MindsDB, and it was like. Let's try this out, and it actually worked great. So that's when I, you know, understood that really it, it it is possible for an expert to use this. But at the beginning, it was maybe not as clear how to contribute to it being an expert in machine learning, and that's why we started with this like refactoring of of the core solution, so that we have like this uh, positive reinforcement cycle where it's easier each time for researchers to contribute, and so you start covering more and more use cases in a better way at the same time that you're enabling the more advanced um, audience or yeah, personas, right? To use the product just the way they want to, right? Mm -hmm. So it really is, you know, what Natasha said, we want this to be used by anyone who wants to access machine learning in the database. That's the, the goal. Well, it's cool that you have a personal story um, <laughs> about how essentially how we fell into it and became um, yep. like the, the, the 
the quote unquote um like ideal user. <laughs> um Indeed. Yeah. So Cassia has uh, another comment coming up here. It says, how does MindsDB benchmark versus other auto ML solutions on the market? Yeah, good question, Costia. Costin, sorry, I'm, I think I'm mispronouncing it. It's Kos, Kostiantin. I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, but okay, but that's a great question. We actually are in the process of like uh, finalizing a pull request to to a benchmarking suite that's called um, AutoML Benchmark Suite by OpenML. And OpenML is this organization that tries to be transparent about you know, machine learning in general. And they have their own AutoML uh, approaches. And we have been running tests against the, the latest published results. And we're doing uh, a lot of progress there. We're actually you know, in the top two, top three solutions there. Of course, results are not updated. But it tells us that our solution is up there in the top when compared to other AutoML frameworks, uh, I, I think at the end of 2018. So that's more or less the, the point of reference we have there. Um, there are use cases for which we don't yet have benchmarks in, in like a, an external way, but we do have internal benchmarks that measure our own progress through time. And that's basically the way that we decide upon changing something or adding a new module and making it the default. So, um, you know, considering like classification tasks, we're doing quite well uh, as OpenML is uh, suggesting. <laughs> OpenML, okay. We'll have to check that out later. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, next question I see from Tran and Q on Facebook is asking, um, can you talk about the common system requirements for using MindsDB? That's a good question. Yeah, I think um, I can speak a little bit to it. In terms of like, for example, GPUs, I think you can get away with using CPUs. It does make your training time a little bit longer. However, it does make it uh, very tricky to train big models like transformers for text. So depending on your use case, you can get away with different things. In terms of re you know import requirements, um, the big one is pandas, which most data scientists have access to, but we have a fairly uh, lengthy list of requirements in all of our repos. Patricio, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, yeah, we use PyTorch, of course. We use scikit-learn for some of the pre-processing steps um, because of you know convenience functions they define. Um, we have been toying around with the SK time library for time series, which is a great tool as well. We highly recommend checking it out. Um, and I, I guess SciPy, NumPy, of course, uh, but those are the main, like the heavyweights there. Uh, we have Hugging Faces Transformers as well. Very important, yeah. yeah. For the text. Got it. So it sounds like also probably check out the repo um, for specific requirements. It's like, a, yeah, to, to know exactly what's, what's needed. Um, good question. Um, kind of, Related to the setup part of it, uh, so can, we, can you talk a little bit about the production? So if I were to you know, finish training and want to move things into production, um, you know, what, what sort of, how does that work? Um, what sort of integrations have, have worked well? Well, I can take this one. Um, the idea is for the production uh, uh, leap of faith or, yeah, I, I guess you can call it that. Uh, to be minimal, really. Like you start prototyping on the database with your like training splits that you defined in the SQL query. Once you know something's working, you define the predictor. You might define also a criteria for like periodically checking whether the error is in, like increasing in your production data. And the queries can of course be saved. And once you realize that the model's not like it needs updating, you can use the like the partial fit that Natasha was mentioning. And the, then there's also like a custom uh, set of procedures for when this is like in a stream context. So if you're uh, if you're using MindsDB from Redis or Kafka, there's a separate bit of logic there that is like constantly monitoring uh, not only the drift, but also as new data comes in, you gotta predict it, right? Um, so we try for the the step of of going into production to be minimally invasive, and hopefully it feels like a very natural continuation of experimenting with MindsDB. I see. Yeah. Um, and actually, can can I just expand on that? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so if if you have a model and you you want to visualize um, how it's doing, 
it's also trivial to use tools like superset tableau or or any tool that is being you know framed as a business intelligence tool that supports mm -hmm. the sql paradigm because you now have the output of your predictor as a table you can save it or or you know look at it temporarily and um it's very easy to see for instance forecasts or get like a confusion matrix or whatever so it's pretty it's a pretty tight loop there hmm. Sorry, could you repeat what was the last the super set you called it? Yeah, superset is a business hmm. intelligence tool that is uh, okay. open source. It's it's Apache, I think it's it's behind the tool, and there's a cloud offering by the guys at Preset. So definitely hmm. check it out too. If okay, yeah, I haven't heard of it myself, but I will I will also look into it. it sounds interesting. Um, cool. Thanks for the answer, Patricio. Uh, so we have another question about, uh, do you support any non-SQL databases like MongoDB? Uh, so sorry to, to have interrupted your previous answer. So I did see that on your on your website, you have a list um, of various uh, databases that I'm assuming that you support. Um, but if you have any anything in addition to add to this, uh, yeah, please, please add it. So this is just directly from their website. So I highly recommend taking a look over there. They have like a lot of good resources, uh, pretty uh, in depth. So, yeah, we do have a connector for Mongo. Um, it's uh, it's a bit of um, like a custom implementation, of course, it being non-SQL. Um, and we do interesting stuff uh, with regards to their collections. So, if you've got nested values and those values are very important columns, we have procedures to unnest them and then nest them back when you're working with that uh, data. So, it's uh, it's an interesting challenge. But it's working. So if you guys are using Mongo and want to check uh, Minds to be out, it's certainly possible. Thanks. Cool. Thanks for the question. So it looks like we are definitely coming towards the uh, end of our time. Uh, but there have been a lot of good questions coming in. So I'll give it like another couple minutes uh, to see if any other last minute questions are. Well, right in time. Hey, Sinomais. So good to see you again on Twitter is coming in. Do you have any interesting? Do you have any interest in adding differential privacy functionality, um, like default functionality for medical data? Hmm. What a cool question. Yeah. Okay. So I think this is something that we haven't explicitly worked on, but definitely is a future idea. Patricia, do you have anything to add? I would just add that if if this is a very important concern for you, it's it's in the realm of possibility for sure to implement MySDB on prem. Um, and, and this, you know, in, in this regard, you just you're the owner of your own data. And also, when working with partners, partners uh, like Snowflake, they do have, you know, privacy functionalities, and we respect that. So, um, as long as you're using that, like a database that has those functionalities, maybe it's not a concern, right? Having said that, differential privacy is super interesting, so we might uh, look into it at some point. Thanks. And then just as we were talking about the last couple of questions, uh, Tran and Q from Facebook uh, has posted another question. Do we have distributed mode uh, for MindsDB? I'm assuming. We do, like we, we support Ray. Uh, Ray is, uh, we use Ray really. Uh, it's a library for distributed computing. And the idea behind that is you can uh, distribute the computation between CPU cores, workers. And if you've got multiple GPUs, that's also possible. It's a bit of an experimental support yet, so it's not full. Like if you ask MindsDB to train over, I don't know, like 12 GPUs, it probably won't use all resources, but we're getting there. Uh, it's a new feature and it's working brilliantly so far. So basically it's in the works and you can try it out and help us get there. Nice. Yeah, so a lot of exciting things kind of in the frontier of, of this space, so yeah. Uh, still opportunities for folks in the audience to to be a part of that conversation. Um, you probably follow the again follow the repo. Um, maybe I don't know if uh, this is suggested, but you know, maybe put in um, what's it called recommendations for requests. Um, so kind of get the idea conversations going um, if if that's something uh, that you're interested in. We Can I? That. Uh, yeah, we have a sure. Slack community as well. Oh, okay. You know, both Patricia and I respond to a lot of the technical questions there, and it's a lot of fun. We get very creative use cases. Mm, yeah, sounds yeah, it's a really good point. Uh, so yeah, definitely check out the Slack community then uh, if you're watching this this live stream. Um, 
so then I guess to round out the round out the conversation, um, we typically like to ask kind of more existential questions at the end. Uh, so just about you know, what are you excited about in in machine learning in general, um, spe either specific to this project or uh, just you know in this space. So I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on that. I think there is a collaborative element that I haven't seen like in really other disciplines that happens in machine learning. There are so many communities of experts who want to work with everybody to solve interesting problems. And I think that genuine curiosity and that creativity and that kindness is something that we strongly strive for. We are open source. We want people to use our packages and try interesting things. And I think that's super exciting in machine learning as a whole. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, personally, I've been very excited to like to follow along the progress that's being made in large models, like you know, a uh, uh, clip. I think it's called GPT-3, of course. And of course, that might be out of my scope as a researcher in terms of compute power. So, the area I've been lately, lately very interested into is calibration. Like, how do you calibrate models? How do you make sure that uh, the predictions they make uh, have a certain degree of you know uh, trustworthy confidence? Um, and that's fascinating to me, actually. It's a new area I've been uh, recently exploring, and it's pretty cool. Hmm. No, I, I highly agree with that. I wish, I don't know if you want to ex expound more on that. It sounds like you've been yeah, yeah, looking yeah. at it. So, mm -hmm. There are lots of approaches that are very like um, specific to certain use cases. Uh, but I've, I've been reading up on the literature, a particular uh, framework, and uh, it's, called, it's called conformal prediction. And it's a very grounded way of, of getting like a generic confidence model for uh, any machine learning model. So it's agnostic to the actual model. And it's a simple uh, formulation. I think it has a lot of potential. It's not very uh, well known yet in the broader machine learning community. So if there are research, uh, researchers listening now, I highly encourage you to check it out because it's, I think it has a lot of potential. Could you repeat the name again? Actually, I'm going Conformal to write prediction. Conformal like, prediction. Okay. Yeah. We're seeing a lot of papers cropping up using them for, for example, explaining text distributions for language generation and whatnot. So I think it's it's a very cool space to be in right now. Mm, okay, for sure. We have to maybe get someone on to talk about that next. <laughs> yeah, or if you guys uh, would come, would be interested to come back on to talk about that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that'd be cool. Um, so with that, yeah, we we again are wrapping up towards the end, but maybe. Last, do you have any last minute things you would like to to share with the community that we haven't talked about yet, or maybe just a recap of, you know, point poignant either resources or things to to keep in mind? I would personally like to thank this instance because I think it's so cool for for you to showcase what people are doing with PyTorch. I believe the package is excellent. We get like we've gotten great support uh, whenever we have issues. People are doing so many cool stuff with it. So, yeah, thank you for for having us here. I mean, it's all you guys. So, so yeah, it's really happy to spotlight you all. Well, likewise, um, we've tuned into a couple of others and the, the wide array of different possibilities with PyTorch is super cool. Yeah, definitely agree. So it's yeah, great to be able to showcase that um, through this through this medium. So yeah, very excited again to, to have you both on. Uh, for folks watching, yeah, please, please uh, give Patricio and Natasha a subscribe on, on Twitter. So their handles are down next to their names. Um, and again, yeah, check out the the website and check out the repo. Uh, lots of really exciting um, exciting things happening there. Uh, so with that, we'll wrap it up for today and uh, see you all next week. All right, bye everyone. See ya. Bye bye. bye.